Rinpoche, dear friends, welcome to be with us in this interview to Zongsa Rinpoche. I'm Karen. Uh, so Rinpoche, a few weeks ago, Kempo Serentashi, the founder and uh, Dhamma's instructor of uh, Ronsom Buddhist Channel and the Yeshikolo Tibetan Buddhist Association Australia, had the honor to have interviewed you, uh, which is really exciting. The interview is then made into five episodes uh, in order that the audience could have the best watching experience, the interview is subtitled. And uh, episode two was just on YouTube yesterday. Both Tibetan speakers and uh, Chinese speakers are really thrilled and eager to see the new updates. Well, the interview has already become the hottest video on Ronsom. We are really grateful that Rinpoche is what, with us today to have this English interview. And people here today are absolutely blessed to have received the blessings uh, Rinpoche gives to Yeshikolo and to Ronsom channel. Especially Rinpoche has given uh, the oral transmission of uh, Ronsom Pandita's Guru Yoga written by Mipa Rinpoche. I am absolutely privileged to have this opportunity to ask questions on behalf of Ronsom and Yeshikolo, but I will try to I will try my best to squeeze eight questions into this 50 minutes uh, interview. So I'm just gonna start the first question. And then Rumbachela, um, the first question is about the pandemic, and uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, um, uh, effect on a human being. Um, so what do you think the three year pandemic has brought to the world as a whole? And how do you think the pandemic has largely affected our everyday life? What impresses you the most? And what should we learn from this pandemic? So that's the first question, thank you. Okay, so first of all, um, I'm happy to be here talking um, also um, participating um, anything to do with um, the great, Ma you know, Mahasandhi master, Rungzum, um, one of the most important um, person who actually commentate uh, generally Buddha Dharma and especially um, Bajrayana and most especially the Mahasandhi tradition. This is one um, master that need to be remembered and that need to be studied and put into practice. So um, I do believe that your endeavor, your activity um, uh, does bring some sort of awareness, at the least the existence of the great masters such as uh, Ronson Pandita. So I want to express my gratitude for inviting me on this platform. So um, to answer your first question, I think uh, the pandemic, of course, obviously this has caused a lot of death and destructions and just, I don't know, stress and um, in many, many different level, uh, health-wise, economy, probably geopolitic, et cetera, et cetera. And um, while a lot of this, this, what has happened, the unfortunate things, is this something that we need to really um, Keep in mind and, you know, um, be mindful so that such such thing will not 
happen in the future, hopefully. But at the same time, as Buddha said, we live in a world that is so driven by cause and condition. And I'm sure, you know, one cannot really guarantee that something like this will not happen even in the future. We have to be alert, we have to be mindful, we have to be vigilant about how to live our life sound, savvy, uh, mindful, compassionate, and, and understanding others' situations. I think this pandemic situation has really made us realize that the dependent world has become even more dependent, faster, more impactful, and um, because what went, what is going on in Sydney, just about 50 years ago, if something happens in Sydney, it takes time, it will take time to reach even the news to neighbor city. Now it is not at all like this. Not only the news travels fast, but actual sort of virus, and not just virus, just everything. Mm. Where we think, where we interact with the different values, these things travel so fast. So this is something that we have learned during this time. Hopefully we human beings will know how to handle this, because if you don't know how to handle this, probably while good things can also happen quite fast and efficiently, but a lot of bad things can also happen fast and efficiently. So we need to be really, really um, diligent. I have to say that while uh, virus, COVID, pandemic, all of this has been a very devastating for a lot of us human beings, I guess, generally speaking. But I think it has also brought a lot of peace, harmony, and some sort of a space for a lot of other beings, like animals, for instance. And that is something that we should be rejoicing. I think sometimes we human beings talk about our own welfare, our own health, our own situation too much. That's all we talk about. We really don't think about other beings, environment, you know, and this is something that we need to, I don't know, appreciate is not, maybe not the right thing to use the word, but this is something that maybe we, we should be aware and maybe it is important to wind down the speed of the world bit, a little bit so that we will have a sound and healthy earth. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Rinpochela. I think it is really very inspiring that when Rinpoche mentions that the pandemic, we, when we human beings talk about pandemic, we, we just talk about pandemic from our perspective. But if we think about the, uh, the animals and the environment, so the pandemic also has some good effect. Thank you very much, Rinpochela. So, uh, and the second question, the second question is about um, the world that we are living in. Uh, the world is now full of uncertainty and unpredictability. 
So as a Buddhist, how should we prepare ourselves for the unforeseeable future? What can we expect about the future of the Buddha Dharma? So that's the second question. Thank you very much, Mbachila. Well, for a Buddhist? Uh, for the well, Buddha Dharma. I mean, uh, if you are asking me, I can only answer you as a Buddhist. And as a Buddhist, actually, to really uh, suddenly discovering that things are so unpredictable is a good thing. But sometimes I really doubt whether we actually, yes, of course, the unpredictability, when it hits us, we don't like it. But the ignorance or the denial of this unpredictability is always there. And this is something that we should not, we should watch out. I probably the unpredictability ha has not really become, I don't know whether it has become even more unpredictable. Maybe we just become more aware of the unpredictability. And also, as I said earlier, because the news travels fast, whatever is unpredictable in Beijing, we know instantly in Sydney, so on and so forth. So as a Buddhist, this is not necessarily a bad thing, but we need to realize what, need to, what we need to learn is how not to deny this. That is where we human beings are not good at because we constantly believe that something will work out. Uh, things are, I don't know, manageable, things are fixable, and certain values are ultimately good, so on and so forth. Okay. Thank you very much, Rinpoche. So, uh, yes, Rinpoche, I mentioned that nowadays, not only the news, but also the, the virus, everything travels very fast. And so that is true that uh, sometimes we are just not so aware of uh, the unpredictability, but actually it is always uh, that unpredictable. Um, and also, it is true that when Rinpoche talked about that, I realized that, yes, uh, we just try to manage everything and we just suppose we are, we are able to manage everything. And I think, yeah, that's true. Uh, and uh, then the third question uh, is about the uh, the difference between the uh, Eastern and Western um, Buddhist practitioners. So Rinpoche, I know that you have uh, tens of thousands of Chinese and Western students and followers. And, uh, but I believe that they are, they are different to some extent. So what are the most noticeable difference between a Chinese and a Western practitioners in terms of interest in Buddha Dharma and the way of practicing the Buddha Dharma? Thank you very much. Okay, this is a very big question. So I don't know whether I could actually cover answering this in a very short time. Yes, you are right. There's definitely uh, differences. And of course, obviously, because not just between West and East, but even the mountain dweller or a desert dweller or a forest, you know, people who live in the jungle or people who live in the uh, city, you know, just because of, you know, environment that you live in, in uh, people who, who you are living with, all of this, uh, you know, creates nuances and differences. Um, Buddhism always has a lot of different challenge. And I think the biggest Buddhist challenge, I would say, is culture, not just East, Western culture, Eastern culture, Southern culture, Northern culture, culture. 
Now I say culture is the biggest challenge because culture is something that we cannot not have. We have to have culture. I mean, even lang I mean, even to communicate between student and the teacher, you need to use a language. And the language is already a big base or the it is the you know like very big culture, right? And um, so culture is something that is indispensable, but at the same time, the danger is culture always hijacks the Buddha's wisdom. And this is a sort of a, this is something that we have to live with. Um, but I think what we, where we need to be careful or where we need to really be smart, if you like, is to always tell us difference between the culture and the wisdom of the Buddha. That I think we need to remind ourselves again and again. And that's a difficult though, because many times, for instance, even the Tibetans, many times Tibetans will teach something. Maybe 50% of what they are teaching is something Tibetan culture, not necessarily the Buddha Dharma. Because it's so intertwined and it is so, what do you call it, for centuries, it is, uh, you know, like, it, it got intertwined too much, which is fine, which is, I mean, as I said, it's not, it's, it's unavoidable. But I think time and again, we need to remind ourselves that this is, uh, there is, difference between culture and the wisdom of the Buddha. Uh, fundamentally, for instance, I mean like Chinese and the Tibet, I mean Chinese and uh, Western, you know, the Western Dharma students, I mean one big obvious difference is the language, right? And I'm, I'm not saying the Chinese speak Chinese language and Westerners speak Western language. Of course, there's that difference. But what I'm saying is language, what is meant by one word, even though we try our, our best to translate the language, it's really difficult because each and every word of a language has a big, big history, background, which has been evolving a lot. So even the word, ninje, karuna, Compassion, I don't know what you uh, say in Chinese. Each culture will bring a different word to translate the Buddha's quality of karuna, mahakaruna, right? But I wonder how much of different people using different language is hearing exactly the same. So these are something that we need to be aware of. This is all I could say today because this is a very big question. Thank you, Rinpoche, for your uh, explanation and answering this question. So yes, uh, culture and the language uh, is really, um, uh, I remember that somebody said that uh, language is like a bridge to, to help understanding and language also is also the thing that differentiate people. So to separate people. Okay, so I think that is also uh, the reason why different languages makes people uh, understand the Buddha wisdom in different ways. And so the language re really actually uh, produces the uh, part of the differences. Okay. And uh, so actually we do very fast. <laughs> and so uh, ne next one, next question. Uh, mm, it seems that the Tibetan Buddhist practitioners in the West are mainly the disciples and students of Choyam Trompa Rinpoche and the 16th Kamapa and Dilgol Kinsa Rinpoche. 
And that is to say, these practitioners, these disciples, these students are getting old. Probably they are in their 60s, 70s, maybe. So I'm wondering if uh, Rinpoche agrees to this observation. And anyway, as an elder, as an older generation Buddhist, what should we do for the sustainable future of Buddha Dharma? I mean, what responsibilities are we expected to take for the benefit of the younger generation Buddhists in the future? So that's my question. Thank you, Ramachila. Mm, yes, this is important question again. Mm, definitely, we need to really think about this. Actually, I would say we are not thinking about this at all. It actually, um, we should be thinking about what you are saying. I would say 50 years ago, we should be talking about this. But so we are almost 50 years, I mean, at least 50 years behind. Um, I think there's a many, many different reasons. One is Buddhism has never been just like Jainism and Advaita, Buddhism is never really associated with a, a state. It's never really directly connected to, you know, uh, social policy, okay, let's call it. I mean, um, the Buddhists don't really worry about how you will get married, or how you will get divorced, how you will be punished uh, if, you, if you have uh, stole some money or things like that. You know, what I'm saying is that unlike Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, which is very, very connected to state, and therefore it's politic. There's a lot of political elements. I mean, I, I think I can safely say it's like a religion, like a Islam, it's, it's, a, it's, it's almost like a political movement, right? The reason why I'm saying this is because it's not really associated with the state. It actually, you know, I mean, the Buddha, he had a state, he had a kingdom and he left. He wasn't interested in the state, state affair. He, his is to see the truth. It's really nothing to do with, you know, like building the community or building a nation. You know, you don't hear Buddhist Republic of blah, blah, blah. You understand? You don't have that. The reason why I'm telling you this is because when you don't have that, the idea of missionary is not really there. So the Buddhist, like, just like Jain, probably, Buddhists don't really have this sort of mission mission driven mission driven sort of a task i i don't think any lama or a thai monk or a guru will tell any of you students okay you go to uh, um, some parts of new zealand and try to establish a buddhist hospital buddhist school and therefore turn them into buddhists you understand so there is you don't have that. So the missionary, missionary element is never there. And this is why I think there has never been a strong preparation to really think about the next generation because your question is the next generation Buddhists. So I'm not saying these as a 
reason why, I mean, I'm not saying this, we should not worry about, actually we should, because at the same time, we do pray that Buddha Dharma will flourish, Buddha Dharma will get propagated, people will be follow, read, you know, understand the Buddha Dharma, so on and so forth. So we have that, even though we are not really missionary oriented. So we do definitely have to speak the language. We do need to really address the young generation. So this is very, very important. And um, some people may think that I am actually uh, talking much more in the uh, talking in a very modern way. You understand? Some people may think, but I will tell you, actually not. I'm already like 20 years behind. I'm already 30 years behind. Um, what the kids listen to, what kind of music they listen, what kind of books they read, what kind of movies they watch, I don't know. And I'm not even interested. I should be interested. I should be really looking at what they're doing. But you know, I don't have the energy. I don't have the will. But uh, hopefully the younger teachers, stakeholders will do that. Okay. Thank you very much here. So uh, I think that Rinpoche used a very interesting word missionary driven task. I really like this word. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but also when Rinpoche said that you are already 20 or 30 years behind the behind the, the age, I don't think so really. Because when I, yeah, when I watched the movie you make and when I, when I saw the photos you take, I don't think you really, uh, you were 20 or 30 years behind. But anyway, uh, I think, yes, probably we, we just worry too much about the younger generation. <laughs> and okay, so let's come to the fifth question. Um, uh, this question is actually more or less related to, to the previous question. So uh, we do, we, we agree that we shouldn't force others into a religion. However, this can be an excuse sometimes when people aren't active to tell others about the strength of taking refuge to the three gems. And the Buddha and our masters of the past, of the present, all teach us to let people know the benefit of learning the Buddha Dharma. So how could we find the balance between not pushing others into a religion and encouraging them to practice Buddha Dharma? This is the question. Thank you very much, Rinpoche. Um, it's like this. I don't think Buddhists have the will, Buddhists have the, I think Buddhists, Buddhists right now, I don't think Buddhists have the will, Buddhists have the strategy, Buddhists have the manpower, uh, economic power to actually go out there and really, really try to, let's say, convert. You know, you are right. Actually, if we do have that will and if we do have that kind of a strategy and manpower, I almost would encourage to do that. Of course, the Buddhists are not going to, you know, force others to become Buddhists at gunpoint. Neither we should really try to make others Buddhists by giving, I don't know, money or whatever, you understand? That's one. But more importantly, right now, Buddhists don't seem to even put attention on people who actually willing to listen to us, asking questions, 
asking for help. Even for them, we are not catering. We are not really, we are not ready to give them what they want and what they need. And this second one is what is quite sad. Okay. Yes, yes, uh, yes. I think uh, sometimes we're really not ready or not willing to give advice or to 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 take other people or to guide other people or in even to persuade other people to to become a Buddhist. And also, we don't have the as Manbuche mentioned that the manpower and economic power because we do not establish schools or we don't establish uh, hospitals to make people, to convert people to become Buddhist. Okay. Uh, but um, next question is about this new era. Uh, I think that uh, this is a similar question as uh, Kempo Tsurantashi uh, asked you in a Tibetan interview. So this age is an, uh, the age of uh, internet or an uh, era of uh, meta. So we do lots of things in virtual ways, like we do oral transformation today in Zoom. And some, maybe some gurus may even do in initiations online. And uh, nowadays we do a lot of, lot of teachings online. Tsurantashi Kempo uh, give us teachings twice or three week, three times a week online. So even the interactions between a guru and his disciples are in Zoom. And so in this, uh, in this technology oriented circumstance, is it possible that we can still keep our traditional means of lineage transmission? Please. Okay, I think it depends. Like if a student need an answer to their questions, if the student needs clarifications, if the student needs information, if that can be delivered by words, language, phrases, communication with basically language, right? I personally think Zoom internet is fine. Of course, after all, that is the device for it, right? Now, there are, especially in the Vajrayana, in the Tantra, there are rituals there that involves substance that need to actually drink and eat and place on your head and stuff like that. That really cannot be really de delivered through just language. And this is, this is uh, something that the lamas should really, I will not, I, 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 will, I don't want to 100% oppose this, but I'm also very cautious about it because this is something that we really need to, because I don't know, Maybe in about 10 years time, our meta and, uh, you know, our internet and our, I don't know, the, this, the power of the web has become so powerful that I could just send you an omelette right now, even as we speak, and then you, may, you will experience the omelette in your mouth. Then I think, we will have to alter our thinking, right? But right now, if, as I said, if, if, the, if the teaching is verbal and communication based on talking, language, I, I think I can accept that. Sound, even the sound. That's why the transmission, I think, is okay. But anything that requires like a substance, anything that requires interaction you see because when we receive when we talk about the tantra sometimes we talk about you know receiving the teaching with your body speech and mind 
So I don't know through the internet whether you can receive the some of the interaction with the body. You understand? So these are the something that we need to really think about. Okay, thank you very much, Ella. So yeah. Uh, verbal communication, so any teachings, any transmission that we can do uh, via verbal communication is uh, probably we can do that on internet, that it's not a problem, but anything that, it, that relates to substance, to the, to the uh, transmission of, of uh, the, uh, the body and yes. the... And also, also atmosphere, creating the atmosphere, such as, you know, burning an incense. You know, those creates atmosphere. I'm not saying that we cannot do at all. As I said, internet is a technology that improves all the time. Who knows, in about a few years time, we can create all of that. Then, you know, I'll be more convinced. Or oh, yeah, probably we can just, we try to expect that. And if that happens, that will be a good thing. Yes. <laughs> And uh, Rinpoche is, uh, is the advocate of uh, 84 translation. And uh, I think it is really a huge project. Mm -hmm. It has achieved a lot, but is there any milestone translation expected to finish in 2023? And if, and also Rinpoche is also known as a film director. I, I believe all the students here uh, are expecting um, a new movie to come. So is there a new, any new movie, any new film released this year? Well, um, please, um, I want to tell people not to expect, yes, uh, first of all, the short answer is yes, I have written a few new film and I've actually, um, in the process of making one, but I just want to not raise too much hope of, of, from the people because as you have already experienced, a lot of my films are not the most exciting, not the most, uh, what do you call it, um, entertaining. So probably my uh, next film will also be uh, something like that. Um, but, you know, I, for me, uh, I believe in telling stories in a different, many, many different ways, because um, not all the story should be told in a certain one specific way. You know, it's a bit like coffee. You can always drink coffee in the Starbucks and you know what you get. Uh, whether you drink in Sydney, whether you drink in Singapore, whether you drink in New York, if you order um, in Starbucks, if you order uh, iced coffee, uh, they all taste the same. And that is a good thing for a lot of, lot of the time and for a lot of the people, it's a good thing because they know what they want, they know what they will get, so which is a good thing. But... I think it is also good that there are some boutique coffee shop who serves the coffee in a slightly different way. And uh, I believe that's how the story also works. Story can be told in a uh, you know, some sort of a set of formula, but not all the stories can, has to be told like that. Okay. Uh, I I remember very well last time. Uh, so in 2017, when Bachela was in Sydney, and also there's the release of the the movie Hema Hema. That's also a very 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 interesting storyteller, and I I personally really love the movie. Uh, mm. I think that as you mentioned that your movie is not that entertaining, but your movie is not for the for the um. For the commercial purpose, that is why. But uh, truly, uh, I really feel very, very inspired. Thank after you. Movie. Thank you very much, Marcella. And uh, so the last question. Uh, okay, we are at the last question. 
And Kenpo Tsurantashi always mentions a Ronsom Pandita, and uh, Ronsom Pandita is very special in both uh, Buddhism and the Buddhist history. And that is why our channel is named Ronsom. So we know Rinpoche also talked about the importance and the significance of uh, Ronsom's books. And also you spoke about Ronsom in the Tibetan interview with uh, Kenpo Serentashi uh, weeks ago. So could you please also talk about Ronsom today to feed our English audience as well? Okay. I, I want to just tell you the story I have heard from an attendant of Jamianchi the Choki Lauder. Okay. Jamian Chenzi Choki Lotus told somebody, some people, that in to, today, today, Rongzompa is sort of not really appreciated enough. Instead, Longchenpa, Tsongkhapa, and the Sake Pandita, these three are very celebrated. Sometimes we call them the three great Manjushiri of Tibet, so on and so forth. But Chenzi Chokulotu said, yes, so the Rongzompa is sort of underappreciated. But he said sort of something like this. He said, but if they ever debate, on one side sits Rongzompa, on the other bench sits three great Manjushri, then it will take long time to actually um, even begin to defeat Rongzompa by the three great Manjushri. I thought this is a very, very important portrait of Rongzompa. I have not read enough, so I'm maybe not the best judge for this, but the little uh, chapters and books I have read uh, of Rongzompa, I have to say the way he present, where he articulate, where he um, explain are very, very, very unique. So unique. His example, his uh, logic, at glance, you may think very, very simple and um, kind of ordinary. But if you contemplate, he is very special. Thank you, Ramachala. So it's really incredible that the three great masters can easily defeat uh, Ronsomba. I think that uh, you give us a very, very vivid description of how special he is. All right, thank you very much, Ramachala. I think that we actually, we just finished these eight questions within 50 minutes. It's almost just 50 minutes. Thank okay. you very much. Thank, thank you very you. much. Uh, so Rinpochella also answer uh, the, these questions and as well as giving us inspirations and the guidance of how to look at the world, how to look at the pandemic, how to look at everything. And I really appreciate this time and uh, the teaching you give to uh, Ronsom and to Yeshikolo students and staff. Thank you. And also I'm looking forward to seeing Rinpochella one day in Sydney. And I would like to invite you to coffee, to, to taste different coffees, to tell different stories there. Thank you very okay. much.